Good morning. I'm delighted to join you to help kick off this year's Small Business and Industry Assistance Regulatory Education for Industry Conference. This conference is an important part of the FDA's ongoing efforts to strengthen our regulatory programs and enhance communication, support, and guidance for businesses like yours that are involved in the development of important medical products. It's especially essential in addressing the particular challenges faced by smaller medical development companies. I've been involved in a number of startups, founding, managing on the board, funding, and I've conducted numerous clinical research studies in conjunction with small businesses in my career. I recognize the critical importance of appropriate interactions with the FDA during medical product development. Many of us here in Washington periodically read Teddy Roosevelt's famous speech, The Man in the Arena. And when it comes to medical products, the small business is in the thick of it, right there in the arena, not standing on the sidelines. Almost no human experience can match the great feeling when an invention or innovation is imagined and then translated into a technology that improves a human condition. And there is also almost no match for the crushing feeling when the development fails. The old ABC Wide World of Sport adage, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat comes to mind. Our goal at the FDA is to help you do the best job possible in developing your products and in generating the evidence that ultimately will determine whether your product makes it to market and increasingly whether it will be paid for. Accordingly, this meeting focuses on one of the most important and frankly one of the most under-recognized and under-appreciated aspects of the FDA's role. How we engage with industry and product developers in support of innovation that can lead to the development of safe and effective new products. There are some who question whether an independent regulatory agency like ours, which reaches its decision based on the collection, review, and analysis of the best available scientific data, should communicate with businesses like yours during the development process. That skepticism is misplaced and is premised on a misunderstanding of the value of these communications to scientific innovation and product development. Make no mistake, as a regulator, the FDA's primary and critical role in the medical product arena is in evaluating the promise and risk of new products and technologies and ensuring the responsible development of innovative medical products while providing regulatory clarity to the industry. And that evaluation must be done independently based on a comprehensive review of available evidence. But regulation can also be a key driver of innovation in the laboratory and across society. And it is an essential aspect of the FDA's mission to protect and promote public health, to engage in appropriate conversations with developers to help direct, support, and advance this innovation and development. While the FDA doesn't reveal confidential commercial information or trade secrets, the composite knowledge of FDA staff who know the field and who have seen all the products in development, both the successes and the failures, can be critical to guide you to the best pathway. Even less appreciated is the importance of helping you avoid human studies that would endanger human subjects because of the aggregate knowledge within the FDA. In so doing, we can help bridge the gap between scientific and technological advances and meeting the need for the groundbreaking new therapies and products that can make a real and lasting difference in the lives of patients and their families. These kinds of discussions and guidance can help developers save time and money, prevent wasted or duplicative efforts, and help ensure speedy development of the best and most effective products. Throughout this meeting, you'll hear from a range of FDA staff and leadership about some of the ways we're working to support your work, and also about some of the most important and impressive recent developments and approvals and some of the exciting developments on the horizon, all of which makes my brief comments this morning a bit challenging. My goal is to try to give you a quick flavor of what you'll be hearing and discussing during the conference. I'll start with some of the activities of our Center for Drug Evaluation and Research and their continuing focus on cross-cutting policy development. This includes facilitating efficiency, innovation, and diversity in clinical trial design and conduct advancing the application of artificial intelligence, and finding more treatments for rare diseases, to highlight just a few of the areas. One subject that plays a key role in our medical products work is user fees. The upcoming reauthorization of the prescription drug, generic drug, biosimilar, 
and medical device user fee agreements will be a particularly important opportunity to address priorities that require a statutory change. I know that you'll be focusing a good deal on the PDUFA 7 goals during this conference. You'll hear about some of the processes and enhancements to existing practices of the Human Drug Review Program that are in the PDUFA 7 commitments, including new approaches to increase efficiencies and expand communication and feedback, such as the Split Real-Time Application Review, or STAR pilot program, we're establishing to allow earlier patient access to therapies that address an unmet medical need. As I noted, early consultation between sponsors and review teams is essential. This is particularly important when the sponsor intends to use a biomarker as a new surrogate endpoint that has never been previously used as a primary basis for product approval in the proposed context of use. By continuing to enhance communications in this area, we can further advance the use of biomarkers in pharmacogenomics and the development of drugs for rare diseases. Despite the increased growth of rare disease drug development, there's still tremendous unmet need for FDA-approved treatments for rare diseases and conditions. This can be especially complex due to limitations in our understanding of disease natural history, the limits of regulatory precedent, small trial populations, lack of trial endpoints that are fit for purpose, challenges in trial design, implementation, and interpretation, and lack of key development tools such as biomarkers. The FDA recently launched the new Accelerating Rare Disease Cures Program to speed and increase the development of effective and safe treatment options, addressing the unmet needs of patients with rare diseases. In addition, our Rare Disease Endpoint Advancement Pilot Program is intended to advance rare disease drug development programs by providing a mechanism for sponsors to collaborate with FDA throughout the efficacy endpoint development process. The work of CEDAR spans the horizon. Consider a few of the other initiatives you'll hear about, including the Advancing Real World Evidence pilot program, which seeks to improve the quality and acceptability of real world evidence-based approaches in support of new intended labeling claims. How we are building on the successes of the patient-focused drug development benefit risk assessment and regulatory decision making. Enhancements and modernization of the FDA drug safety system and efforts to boost the use of digital health technologies to support drug development and review. And that's just scratching the surface. Let me turn next to our Center for Biologics. Throughout the pandemic, the Center for Biologics has continued to meet the enormous emergency demands involved with reviewing investigational new drug submissions, emergency use authorization requests, and biologics license applications for vaccines to prevent COVID-19. Additionally, the center has continued to engage with stakeholders, both in the U.S. and internationally, to advance the science of COVID-19 vaccine development, the implementation of COVID-19 vaccination programs, and the ongoing evaluation of safety and effectiveness of authorized and approved COVID-19 vaccines. You'll hear a good deal more about all these extraordinary efforts during today's plenary session. Of course, CBER also continues to support and facilitate development of biological products, including other vaccines, blood products, allergenic therapies, bacteriophage therapies, and cellular gene and tissue-based therapies, and xenotransplantation products. Over the past year, for instance, CBER has approved two vaccines for prevention of invasive pneumococcal disease one vaccine for prevention of tick-borne encephalitis, and another vaccine for prevention of hepatitis B virus infection in individuals 18 years of age and older. And the Center for Biologics also continues to improve new treatments developed based on scientific advances in the fields of genetics, cellular biology, and tissue engineering. Within just the last year, for example, the Center for Biologics reviewed and approved two new CAR T-cell products, You'll be hearing updates from the Center for Biologic staff on developments with a number of these advanced therapies and how early advice and communication has supported innovation. The center also continues to facilitate and assist new product development. For instance, we issued several new guidance documents, including two which support development of CAR-T products and human gene therapy products incorporating human genome editing. Our newly established advanced technologies team supports innovation and product design, 
in manufacturing by promoting dialogue with prospective innovators and developers of advanced manufacturing technologies. And to help advance patient engagement in the development of regenerative medicine therapies, the center has launched a regenerative medicine therapy outreach and education campaign and established the Regen Med Ed workshop and webinar series for patient advocates. This year's workshop occurred just last week, bringing together patient stakeholders to discuss the importance of natural history studies. You'll be getting more details on these and other work during the upcoming sessions. Let me now shift to our Center for Devices and Radiologic Health, or CDRH, and some of the forward-looking advances in regulatory policy by Jeff Shuren and his team. I want to underscore again the key role that medical device user fees, or MEDUFA, has played in driving the tremendous evolution in the FDA's devices program. The latest MEDUFA agreement, MEDUFA 5, supports both the FDA's capacity to assess new medical device technologies and continues to provide a predictable, transparent path to market while addressing critical resource gaps. Under previous MEDUFA agreements, CDRH made progress on reducing review times and bringing devices to patients more quickly, while also enabling the FDA to move forward in critical areas, including advancing work to support innovation in digital health, strengthening the partnership with patients, enhancing programs to adopt consensus standards, and improving the ability to leverage real-world evidence towards regulatory decisions. One result of this is an increasing number of innovators bringing their devices to the U.S. first before seeking to market them in other nations. MEDUFA 5 has also supported advancement of the patient perspective in regulatory decisions, continuation and expansion of the use of consensus standards to support device development and testing, leveraging of real-world evidence for regulatory decision-making, and enhanced coordination with international regulators, among other priorities. One exciting development is the Total Product Lifecycle Advisory Program Pilot, or TAP, which will provide earlier, more frequent, and more strategic engagement with sponsors of products designated under the Breakthrough Device Program and included in the Safer Technologies Program. TAP will build on lessons learned from these programs, as well as from the FDA's experience during the COVID-19 pandemic response, helping foster innovation and assuring that device developers have a clear, predictable path to market so that patients have timely access to new devices. I know you'll be hearing a good deal more about the TAP from Jeff Shuren later in the program. CDRH's successes in delivering on the promise of new technologies also comes from its efforts to engage a variety of stakeholders across the medical device ecosystem. Next month, for instance, the FDA's Patient Engagement Advisory Committee will meet virtually to discuss and make recommendations on factors to consider when evaluating the benefits, risks, and uncertainty of augmented reality and virtual reality medical devices. I encourage you to attend the meeting and participate in this important discussion. As you can tell, a lot of great things are happening in our medical product centers. Unfortunately, time prohibits me from going into more detail about these exciting initiatives and achievements. But what I can tell you is that one of the reasons I was so honored to return to the FDA is because of my interest in building on the strong foundation that's been established. By working together to strengthen our regulatory systems, we can continue to enhance innovation and create more and better products that make a difference to patients. Before I close, let me add two key ways that you can support these efforts. The first is to improve our approaches to generating reliable knowledge about the benefits and risks of the products you develop. And the second is to help counter the growing dissemination of misinformation and disinformation about science, medicine, and the FDA. These issues are not specific to the FDA, but they do affect the entire scope of our work and therefore your work. It's one of the FDA's greatest strengths that we reach our decisions by applying rigorous data and the best available evidence, and of course the expertise of our talented and dedicated workforce to review, analyze, and synthesize this material. But our evaluations are only as good as the evidence that you generate in your research studies. The sophistication of the many types of studies needed is increasing, and I don't need to tell you that meeting the FDA standard to reach the market is only one step. 
A less the quality of the evidence is also sufficient to convince clinical experts and the payers, your good work will not reach its potential. You'll hear a lot more about successful evidence generation today, but I hope you'll also be a student of the evolving science of clinical evaluation. It will be useful to you and your companies. Generating reliable and high quality evidence is essential. In the past, we've generally communicated our findings, decisions, and thinking through traditional and trusted means, rulemaking, guidances, and other official agency statements. But today, the constant stream of information, opinion, and too often disinformation has eroded a good deal of the trust in agencies like ours, and regrettably, in the science upon which these decisions are based. People are increasingly distracted and misled, and that impacts your work as well. We know that this problem can't be solved by the FDA alone. The connections you have in your professional and personal communities can help break through the disinformation echo chamber. I urge you to allocate some of your professional and trade association time to join together to promote reliable information and to discredit misinformation or disinformation defined as misinformation intentionally designed to harm people. It's not going to be easy, but the good news is we really do have the facts on our side. I want to thank you again for your participation in this conference. We look forward to continuing to work with you to support, innovate, find solutions, and provide patients with more answers. Thank you so very much, Dr. Califf, for that very informative overview of the important initiatives being undertaken by all three centers and how that work relates to our audience. Thank you again. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce my CDRH colleague, Elias Malis, who co-hosted this, who has co-hosted this event with us since 2012. As customary, Elias will conduct this year's plenary session in his role as the moderator. Mr. Malice began his 28-year FDA career in 1994 and devoted the next 17 years in the Office of Device Evaluation, ODE, where he conducted regulatory review and developed policy for a diverse range of medical device programs, such as 510Ks, IDEs, PMAs, and HDEs. He has held many varied leadership positions throughout those 28 years and currently serves as the Director of the Division of Industry and Consumer Education, DICE, in the Office of Communication and Education, OCE, in the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, CDRH, a position he has held since 2011. Mr. Malice leads a division whose mission is to educate industry and consumer stakeholders with understandable and accessible science-based regulatory information about medical devices and radiation-emitting electronic products. Please, let us welcome Elias Malice. Thank you, everyone, for joining us for this year's Ready Annual Conference. It's great to be with you once again for our 11th year. For our global audience, whether you're following us on YouTube Live or joining us through the FDA website, it's truly my distinct pleasure to give you a warm welcome to the Ready Conference. And it's my honor to serve as your moderator for this year's plenary session. It's a time-honored Ready tradition to kick off the technical portion of the five-day conference with the plenary session. This is where all attendees from all the program tracks come together for the one time during the conference for a topic that we believe connects us all. It's both an ambitious challenge and very enjoyable to select the right topic for the plenary, something that connects drug, device, and biologics regulatory policy. Now, for you ready veterans out there, we might recall some of the topics we've covered over the years. Combination products, rare disease treatments, and real-world evidence. And with last year's expansion to include a third track for biologics, it was our privilege to present you with the topic of FDA's emergency response to the COVID-19 pandemic, featuring the esteemed three center directors from CDRH, CEDAR, and CBER. Well, here we are another year down the road, 
and COVID remains on the forefront of our public health challenge. As a result, it was only fitting that we bring back this topic, as well as our FDA leadership, for their update on FDA's response to COVID. We'll hear from Dr. Jeff Sharon, Director of the Center for Devices and Radiological Health, or CDRH. Dr. Patrizia Cavazzoni, Director of the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, or CEDAR. And finally, Dr. Peter Marks, Director of the Center for Biologics, Evaluation, and Research, or CBER. We'll start off with a presentation from our panelists, and then return with an interactive roundtable discussion with you. It's my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Jeff Shuren, who will get things started for us today. Dr. Shuren has been the director for CDRH since 2009. Over this extensive time, he has provided executive leadership to foster device innovation and advance the safety and effectiveness of medical devices and radiation-emitting products, and, of course, including the wide variety of therapeutic, diagnostic, monitoring, and protective devices in the fight against COVID. Again, thanks for joining us at Ready 2022 and this year's plenary session, COVID-19, what's next for FDA. Take it away, Jeff. Thank you, Elias. Well, it's a pleasure to be here today and to talk to you about updates from CDRH on what we've been doing to respond to the pandemic and where that's taking us moving forward. So the actions we've taken come in two flavors. The efforts we have underway to facilitate medical devices on the marketplace to address COVID-19, and then the work that we're doing to address supply chain, and in particular, prevent or mitigate shortages. So starting with availability of medical products, during the pandemic, we were able to take advantage of our emergency use authorization authority. And using that and full marketing authorization, we have helped bring to the market now almost 2,300 medical devices to address COVID. And that includes over 460 tests and self-collection kits. And now there are over 430 still on the marketplace. We're talking about ventilators, personal protective equipment, uh, dialysis equipment, and others. And throughout the pandemic, we've now received over 8,000 EUA requests and pre-EUA requests. These are opportunities for developers to work hand in glove with our reviewers to get their questions answered and to problem solve in real or near real time. It's one of the examples of the extensive engagement we've had with developers. That also includes over 100 town halls and webinars, over 330 frequently asked questions with over 550 updates, 28 guidance documents update about 21 times. Also important during the pandemic was our collaboration. We engaged in extensive collaboration with both domestic and international partners. Let me highlight one of those, and that's with NIH, because it's now led to activities that hopefully will continue outside of the pandemic. For starters, we were involved with NIH on the ground level with their RADx initiative, which is a shark tank approach for identifying and facilitating the development and ultimate marketing authorization of tests for COVID that are being used at point of care and at home. And so far, we've authorized 39 tests through that program. We also, for the very first time with NIH, set up a capability for the federal government to validate tests and be able to leverage that information to support marketing authorization. We started with the National Cancer Institute for assessing antibody tests, and then with NIBIB for a program for evaluating over-the-counter antigen tests. And this has reduced the time and cost for developers for assessing their products. It's given us greater confidence in the data, and it's expedited our review for getting product on the marketplace. Also throughout the pandemic, we've been evaluating the impact of variants on test performance, working with developers and others. And we've identified some molecular diagnostic tests whose performance has been adversely affected by some variants. And more recently, identifying that antigen tests 
pretty much across the board, have had reduced performance in the setting of Omicron. And then working with developers on the best steps for addressing those impacts, in some cases, even tests coming off the marketplace. Moving forward, this is the kind of activity that we, with CDC and others, will continue to be engaged in monitoring for this virus and for others. In fact, we'll continue to work with NIH in our ability to clinically assess the impact on antigen tests to assure that they continue to work well as new variants arise. As we're moving from a pandemic stage to an endemic stage, we also know the time will come when we no longer need products on the market through emergency use authorization. So we've now issued two guidance documents to facilitate that transition. One is for makers of products that are on the market through emergency use authorization who may be interested in keeping their products on the market in full marketing authorization. And the others are for products on the marketplace under our enforcement policies. Those guidances lay out our recommendations for what they need to do to stay on the marketplace. For example, when to submit pre-market submission. Right now, they've been out for comment. We're reviewing those comments, and our intent is to issue the final guidances later this year. But if you do have a product out there right now under emergency use authorization, don't wait to get the rest of the data to support full marketing authorization. Get it now and come in the door. And if you have any questions, please come talk to us, particularly if you'd like to leverage real-world evidence. To date, we've granted full marketing authorization for 16 devices that have transitioned from an EUA, and three of those have leveraged real-world evidence and support. So out of the pandemic, there are a lot of lessons learned, many of them around tests, but some that are also cross-cutting. You can see on the slide a number of them. Let me highlight just a few. In the case of tests, far and away what's critical is that we de-risk the enterprise for developers. It's something that the government did with vaccines that proved very effective, and it's something that we can do with tests. In fact, South Korea did it effectively. In some parts of this, the U.S. government did later on, also to great benefit for the American public. So what this includes is entering into contracts where we pre-position test developers, namely working with developers who can make the kinds of tests we need and in large supply. And then when the need arises, the contracts are in place, the manufacturers are ready to go, and we can have tests produced quickly and in large volumes. And then further to the rest the enterprise by assuring that there are minimum purchasing of those tests that are authorized by the FDA, that there's guaranteed reimbursement, and there's additional funding to support greater production. We've also learned the hard way that it's important that we are assessing tests and other medical devices before they go out on the marketplace. Under some of our policies, like notification, we let tests go to the market once they were validated by the developer and they notified us they wanted to go ahead and market those tests, then send us the data for our review. But during our review, we identified many tests that had issues, either with their design, performance, or their validation. We worked with the developers to address them. In some cases, the tests needed to be modified. In other cases, tests needed to come off the marketplace. And we've also seen how important it is that we invest in the tests that we need tomorrow, today, and in particular, those for point of care and at home. One of CDRH's strategic priorities for 2022 to 2025 is advancing health equity, recognizing that all patients should have access to high-quality care. And technology is that bridge for patients to get care who have difficulty getting access to the health care system, including those who may be in a difficult to reach geographic locations. One of those aspects is then having more at-home tests available so people can get tested at home, at work, and at play. And that's one of our priorities and big efforts as we move forward coming out of the pandemic. And then finally, let me mention the importance of regulatory flexibility and engagement with developers. Through our EUA authorities, we had tremendous flexibility to tailor the regulatory pathway 
to the technology. That combined with engagement, like through our pre-EUAs, working with developers in real or near real time, was the secret sauce to getting so many medical devices on the market quickly to address COVID. In fact, that experience has informed recommendations that we have put to Congress as part of a reauthorization of the Medical Device User Fee Act that, if enacted, would then put in place that kind of a pre-EUA approach in peacetime. Under what we call the Total Product Life Cycle, or TPLC Advisory Program Pilot, or TAP, we would now offer that kind of engagement to select manufacturers of products. What that would look like is, rather than in Medufa, where there's a lot of emphasis on expediting pre-market review, we know that the biggest pain points are what happens before then, during that valley of death, as you go from concept all the way to market authorization. If we can reduce the time and cost uh, from concept to the point where you're submitting to FDA, will have a huge impact on innovation and patient health. In fact, that will help streamline the review of submissions that come to us. So what does this look like? Well, already we have a pre-submission process, but can we significantly shorten the time frame for these important technologies, even more so drive interactions that we are working fluidly, not in a stage gauge approach? and in real or near real time with developers. And then add on a new position, what we call the TAP advisor. These are individuals who are the liaison with the companies who are working with them proactively on the strategy to get to the marketplace. And quite frankly, if you're going to succeed, succeed quickly. And if you're going to fail, fail fast. Now, this pilot would be open to makers of devices that have been designated as breakthrough or those that are part of our Safer Technologies Program, or STEP. And on the supply chain side, when we rolled into the pandemic, we did not have any dedicated funding given to us for supply chain and shortages program, and we had no authorities, in particular requiring notification for disruptions in manufacturing that might lead to a shortage of a critical medical device. And so the U.S. was really flying into this blind regarding supply chain. And that had, of course, a big impact on our ability to address COVID. Now, to Congress's credit, during the course of the pandemic, we were given one-time funding to help set up a supply chain and shortages program, and now got a little bit of base funding for us to make that a permanent program. And we also got authorities, particularly for requiring critical information, but it's limited to the setting of a public health emergency. Now, with that, we've been able to prevent or mitigate scores of device shortages, affecting a whole host of products from ventilators and tests, diagnostics, as well as personal protective equipment. But of course, once the pandemic or public health emergency hits, it's too late at that point to stop many of the shortages as we learn from COVID. And of course, shortages are due to many other causes, such as the weather, recall, cybersecurity issues. So it's important that we have that authority, not just in the setting of a public health emergency, but at all times, because doctors and patients don't care what the cause of the shortage is. They just want access to critical medical devices. And as you can see on the slide here, just a range of products that have been subject to at risk for shortages. So with the funding that we have, we're already building that program to move from a reactive stance to a proactive, ultimately preventative. What will be critical, though, and we're working with Congress, is to get the rest of the funding so that we can ensure we have a permanent program in place so we continue work with developers, healthcare providers, and distributors, and also that we get the critical authority we need to have the information that will help us prevent and mitigate future shortages. So in summary, what's come out of the pandemic is the importance of cross-organizational collaboration and moving forward, the engagements that we've had of today will continue into tomorrow and will get expanded, both domestically and internationally, 
as well as applying other lessons learned and new initiatives and efforts that will help us not just be better prepared for the next public health emergency, but things that we're applying in peacetime, such as, if it comes to pass, the TAP pilot. Well, with that, I'll just say thank you very much, and I'll turn it back to you, Elias. Thank you, Jeff, for your remarks on CDRH's continued response to COVID-19. Let's now continue this discussion and learn more about the updates on FDA's drug policies in response to COVID with Dr. Patrizia Cavazzoni, Director of the Center for Drug Evaluation and Research, or CEDAR. Serving in this role since 2019, Dr. Cavazzoni provides executive leadership to advance CEDAR's mission to ensure that safe, effective, and high-quality drugs are available to the public. Thank you, Patrizia. Hello, I'm really delighted to be here today to uh, provide you with an update on what we have been doing at CEDAR. And my update today will focus uh, on uh, two fronts. The first will be to uh, get you up to speed with uh, our pandemic response efforts. The pandemic is not over and we're still uh, very involved in the, uh, in the response. In addition to that, I would like to highlight some things that we have learned during the pandemic that we think uh, are going to remain part of our tool belt in a post-pandemic world because we think that they have allowed to promote innovation and that allowed us and will allow us to continue to be uh, uh, more agile and more flexible uh, going forward. And what I'm going to start with is some remarks on uh, digital health technologies. Now, digital health technologies are not new aspect of clinical trials. However, during the pandemic, we have really seen an expansion of the utilization of uh, these technologies uh, as an essential tool to allow also greater use of decentralized clinical trials, which uh, we are very important during the pandemic to be able to continue to enroll patients, evaluate patients, and so on, without having patients and trial subjects having to uh, go to investigative sites uh, during lockdowns and, and so on. And so um, to that effect, we have published an important guidance on the use of digital health technology for remote data acquisition. And this, uh, we hope, will uh, provide some clarity for industry on, on the use of uh, health technologies. As I mentioned earlier, we really had to uh, expand the uh, utilization of decentralized clinical trials during uh, the pandemic. And this is a good thing because uh, uh, decentralized clinical trials uh, have uh, some very distinct advantages that will serve us well in a post-pandemic world. So, for instance, uh, they allow us to uh, reach to uh, populations that would not necessarily have access to clinical trials. There are some studies that have shown that as uh, low as only 1% of eligible patients actually participate in clinical trials. And one of the reasons for that is that uh, it is uh, it can be very cumbersome to be in a clinical trial, so to have to travel to investigative site for evaluations, for lab work, and et cetera. So decentralized clinical trials uh, have really helped us during the pandemic and uh, we think that they're, it's, it, they're here to stay in a post-pandemic world. We provided some guidance to sponsors uh, during our a, a guidance that we issued on conduct of clinical trials to, during the COVID-19 public health emergency. And we are working on a uh, go-forward guidance that will uh, entrench uh, the utilization of decentralized clinical trials going forward and uh, we hope that it, it will be uh, available uh, in a short time frame. Another area where we have had a lot of learnings during the pandemic is in the uh, evaluation or assessment of facilities, be that manufacturing facility, clinical investigative sites, sponsor inspections, pharmacovigilance inspections, and so on. Obviously, there were some points during the pandemic where it was very difficult to do on-site inspections of, of all these facilities due to travel restrictions, uh, accessing quarantine requirements in some countries, and so on. And so we really had to quickly develop and refine some alternative tools to uh, do these evaluations. And these tools have really served as well. Obviously, they're not 
fit for purpose for every single situation. There will always be some instances where we have no choice to uh, do an on-site inspection. And examples of those instances are in facilities, be that manufacturing or investigative sites, et cetera, that are completely new to us, for instance, that have, that have no inspection history, or facilities that have a poor track record when it comes to quality and compliance. However, we do see these alternative approaches to inspections, which entail uh, document review, sometimes a remote uh, camera assessment, and so on, to be part of our uh, tool belt in, in the post-pandemic world. And uh, uh, we think that it will uh, allow us to be more agile and flexible in certain situations. The development of therapeutics uh, for COVID-19 has been uh, another uh, core element of our response to the pandemic. And using the uh, uh, emergency use authorization uh, authorities, we have been able to authorize uh, numerous therapeutics in very short time frames that have really been unprecedented in, uh, in, in, in drug development. Now, while emergency use authorization is a very useful tool during a public health emergency, once a public health emergency is over, we can no longer rely on EUAs uh, to maintain these therapeutics uh, on the market and available to patients or prescribers. Bringing therapeutics to patients uh, uh, during the public health emergency has been a, uh, another core element of our response to the pandemic. And uh, using our emergency use authorization tools, we have been able to uh, authorize uh, numerous uh, therapeutics uh, for COVID-19 that span the entire spectrum of the disease from uh, mild to moderate disease in the outpatient setting to more severe disease in uh, hospitalized patients all the way to uh, to very severe disease that require uh, admission to the ICU. Now, emergency use authorizations are a a very important tool. However, they're very much tied to uh, the public health emergency. And so we need to start thinking ahead on how these products uh, will remain available after the uh, public health emergency ends. And uh, to that effect, we have been uh, giving a lot of thought on uh, how to uh, work with sponsors to uh, ultimately uh, have them file for applications and so that we can uh, review and uh, and approve these, these products. And to that effect, we started working very early with sponsors when they came in with a request for EUA to ensure that the the data that they provided us uh, could serve ultimately as the foundation, maybe with additional data, uh, to support an application for an NDA and DLA so that these products uh, could ultimately uh, uh, remain available uh, following uh, the public health emergency. During the pandemic, we really also have to amplify our efforts to uh, monitor the drug supply chain in order to uh, prevent or mitigate uh, shortages. And uh, beginning very early in the pandemic, we realized that the disruptions in the supply chain uh, were of a magnitude that we had really not seen before. And so uh, starting from our established and, and highly functioning drug shortage surveillance program at CEDAR, we uh, built upon that uh, additional uh, aspects that allowed us to uh, monitor the drug supply chain, for instance, by receiving information directly from uh, healthcare facilities uh, when they were running low of uh, essential medicines, such as medicines that are required to uh, maintain a patient on the uh, on a ventilator. And in addition to that, we have been fortunate to receive uh, funding from Congress uh, to continue to build uh, a, a drug supply chain monitoring system. And this monitoring system is really uh, based on uh, advanced analytics of uh, uh, multiple sources that give us intelligence on the status of the drug supply chain, as well as uh, uh, a framework to uh, detect, uh, evaluate, and adjudicate signals of potential disruption in uh, drug supply uh, that we will also um, uh, support through, uh, uh, through technology. And this program will continue post-pandemic. Uh, uh, while we started off by uh, paying a lot of attention to uh, essential medicines that were, you know, very specific to uh, treating patients with COVID-19, and of course we're at times in shortage because of the volume of patients that we had at times, 
uh, we see this as a, a, a program that will go forward uh, post-pandemic and will uh, continue to focus on a, a broader scope of uh, essential medicines. I would like to also highlight uh, probably the most important uh, element of our pandemic response and uh, of uh, the work that we will continue post-pandemic, and this is our uh, talent and, and our staff. During the pandemic, we have seen uh, uh, ebbs and flows when it comes to uh, our ability to hire and retain staff. Uh, very early in 20. 20 through uh, maybe the first half of 2021, we actually uh, observed uh, historically low rates of attrition. So obviously, uh, um, those were not times where people were moving around or, or thinking about uh, uh, selling homes and, uh, and, and changing jobs and et cetera. We saw a bit of a spike uh, in, in attrition in uh, the late summer 2021, and now we're pretty much back to historical uh, attrition rates. And uh, we are very conscious of the fact that we have uh, a lot of competition from the world out there, including the private sector. And with the uh, greater flexibility by employers when it comes to uh, uh, re working remotely, we also know that uh, it is increasingly possible to change jobs without necessarily having to uh, move and have the, ch the kids change schools and et cetera. And so we really want to create an environment uh, at CEDAR and at FDA that has the same flexibility so, as uh, um, some of those that are offered by private employers, including uh, a workplace uh, flexibility options, and as well as uh, a continuing opportunity for career development uh, and uh, advancement. The uh, Title 21, which is the, which is the hiring and pay authority that Congress has given us as part of the 21st century cures legislation, uh, has been a very important tool in terms of uh, uh, being more competitive with the private sector. And while we cannot be entirely competitive, it has really allowed us to uh, hire people in a, in a more streamlined fashion, be more competitive from a salary standpoint, and also leverage this uh, uh, authority to, to retain the staff. Last but not least, I, I also want to mention the importance of uh, the work environment and the, the, the culture in, when it comes to um, acquiring and, and retaining staff. And to that effect, uh, uh, this year we are really paying a lot of attention to culture, including equal voice, diversity efforts, and, and civility. And there's a number of initiatives within CEDAR, including a uh, revamping of the equal voice map, as well as civility training for leadership and staff that we think are going to be very important in continuing to maintain a culture where our staff are going to uh, to thrive and uh, that will keep uh, and, and attract talent. So in summary, um, the pandemic has really been a, a great challenge for all of us and uh, uh, it, uh, it has really forced us to think outside of the box in, in many areas. And uh, despite the fact that we uh, have really um, had to double down on, uh, on, on, our, on uh, all our efforts during the pandemic, in addition to having to uh, focus a large amount of our resources and efforts on, on pandemic response, we have uh, been able to uh, continue to uh, deliver on uh, on all fronts at CEDAR. And this is, uh, uh, from my perspective, almost exclusively, if not exclusively, due to uh, our incredible staff and uh, our dedication to uh, our mission. And uh, through this uh, challenging path over the past two and a half years, we have also discovered some new ways of doing things. And uh, we're not going to let go on, uh, of uh, um, uh, some innovation or different approaches that we think has served as well during the pandemic and that we think are going to uh, really be very useful in, uh, uh, in the post-pandemic world, such as uh, decentralized clinical trials, such as uh, alternative tools to uh, facility evaluation, supply chain, and so on. And so I hope that uh, this uh, um, overview has uh, really uh, given you some sense of where we are and where we're going uh, in, in, in the future. And uh, I would like to thank you for your attention today. Patricia, thank you for your remarks on CEDAR's update on COVID. Let's conclude our presentation segment with an update on vaccines and biologics with Dr. Peter Marks. 
Dr. Marks has been the director of the Center for Biologics, Evaluation, and Research since 2016. Over this time, he has overseen CBER's efforts in assuring the safety and effectiveness of biological products, including vaccines, allergenic products, blood and blood products, and cellular tissue and gene therapies. And of course, the center has been on the forefront of the public health emergency with the review and approval of vaccines in response to COVID. Let's now hear from Peter. Thanks very much for joining today. I'd like to tell you a bit about what our center has done towards helping facilitate vaccine development during the COVID-19 pandemic. And to do so, I want to start by telling you what traditional vaccine development looks like, and then outline what accelerated vaccine development looked like as it was put in place during the pandemic. So traditionally, vaccine development is highly de-risked. Manufacturers move in steps through the various phases of development from phase one to phase two to phase three. And usually towards the end of that process, they scale up their commercial manufacturing process. Now, in the accelerated vaccine development that was done as part of Operation Warp Speed, the real intervention that made a difference here was that manufacturing scale up was done simultaneously with the large clinical trials that demonstrated the effectiveness or that were planned to demonstrate the effectiveness and the safety of the vaccines. And that made a very large difference because at the end of this process, when the clinical trials actually demonstrated that the vaccines were safe and effective, there were large supplies of vaccine available to be able to start immunizing people. Now, to get there, FDA published two guidance documents to help sponsors understand how we intended to see vaccines developed. One was on the development and licensure of vaccines to prevent COVID-19, and that provided some general guidance on our expectations, including what we expected to see for efficacy and safety in general. And then we published another guidance on emergency use authorization, which specifically described what we would need to see from sponsors if we were to give an emergency use authorization to a vaccine. And just to understand the context for emergency use application, I want to back up and talk about what vaccines are normally licensed or the way they're normally licensed, which is under a biologics license application. And those are the vaccines that we get every year, like the influenza vaccine. They have received a biologics license application approval. And that is under the Public Health Service Act, Section 351. And the vaccines have to be shown to be safe, pure, and potent. And they have to meet our effectiveness standard, uh, having evidence from adequate and well-controlled clinical trials showing substantial evidence of effectiveness. Now, for emergency use authorization, we have a different standard. And emergency use authorization, which was put in place after the terrorist attacks of 9-11, they allow us to make potentially life-saving medical products available in a declared public health emergency uh, when there's not an approved and available alternative. And the standard that's used is the product may be effective and that its known and potential benefits outweigh the known and potential risks. Now, the emergency use authorization is a wonderful tool because it is highly adaptable to different medical products, ranging from monoclonal antibodies to vaccines to devices. It's flexible. It can adapt to the, the specific nature of different threats, be they biological, chemical, or radionuclear. And it's agile. It allows us to make changes in the product fact sheets, which is essentially their labeling, uh, rapidly as data emerge. Now, the COVID-19 vaccine development was something we had to think about carefully because we knew that these vaccines were going to be used in hundreds of millions of people. And that meant that rather than using a very low bar of just may be effective, we decided we wanted to set the bar somewhat higher in order to help people have confidence that the vaccines that they were going to have put in their arms were likely to benefit them and that they were safe. And so we put out in our guidance that for an emergency use authorization for a COVID-19 vaccine, 
there would have to be evidence from well-designed phase three clinical trials that was clear and compelling for the vaccines that we would carefully evaluate the safety, quality, and efficacy of the vaccines, that we would do so in a public way, taking these vaccines to a public advisory committee meeting, and that public advisory committee meeting would have notes, that is, the various briefing documents posted on the web for all to see, and that we would make that uh, meeting uh, publicly available. And then finally, that we would also make sure that we did a very good job with safety surveillance after these vaccines were launched. So what happened? We have several candidates for vaccines. The mRNA candidates included the Pfizer-BioNTech and the uh, Moderna mRNA vaccines. The uh, mRNA vaccines uh, were granted uh, emergency use authorization in December of 2020. And then subsequently, both of these were licensed in August of 2021 and in January of 2022 for Pfizer and Moderna, respectively. There are some other viral and non-viral vectored uh, vaccines that are in development as well. The non-replicating viral vector vaccines in development include the Janssen adenoviral vectored vaccine, for which we granted an emergency use authorization in February of 2021. AstraZeneca also has a vaccine that's adenoviral vectored, and that is in use outside of the United States. And then there are two protein subunit vaccines in development, which are in various stages of submission to FDA for evaluation. That is the Novavax uh, vaccine and the Sanofi vaccine, both of those protein subunit vaccines that do not involve uh, either a viral vector or an mRNA. So the, just to say a little bit more, the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine approval happened in a really record time, about less than 100 days from the submission of the biologics license application. It was a relatively large file and it included review of data uh, on uh, uh, over 44,000 participants. And the vaccine was highly effective, 91% uh, effective, and involved the data being reviewed on 12,000 people uh, who had received uh, the vaccine and were followed for at least six months. That gave us good sense of the safety of the vaccine and led to an approval that was every bit uh, the kind of vaccine approval that we would have done uh, for any other vaccine. Similarly, with Moderna, when we uh, approved uh, the Moderna vaccine for the biologics license application, the uh, review was on over 30,000 participants with 93% efficacy and 7,500 participants who had been followed for at least six months. Again, these, the size of the population studied here, the length of the follow-up, were similar to the approvals that we would do for any other vaccine. So at this point, we are lucky enough to have two vaccines that are approved in adults that meet all of our standards. So what went right here in the development of these vaccines? Well, clearly, the guidance that we provided to manufacturers in terms of the formal guidance documents, as well as informal interactions that we had along the way of development, was very helpful to manufacturers, and it continues to be. But possibly one of the most important insights about the vaccine development process which is probably applicable to other medical products, is that the incredibly timely communication that we had with manufacturers was very helpful in moving this process forward. I kind of like to joke that in some ways we became like a dry cleaner. There was a lot of our communication in by nine and out by five, and I'm actually serious about that, where we would get questions in the morning from a sponsor, and we would reply to them before we went home in the evening. And that made a huge difference. And importantly, I think the transparency that we had for the public in this process, both by posting our documents and taking the vaccine authorizations or our consideration of vaccine authorizations to an advisory committee were very helpful. So just to summarize, 
Rather than resulting from a fundamental change in any single process, the success of rapid vaccine development during the COVID-19 pandemic was based on optimizing existing processes and technology, and to a large extent on the communication that we maintained with product developers. Really, some of what we learned during the COVID-19 pandemic may help us moving forward for other medical products to help them expedite development. Thank you so much. Thank you very much to our panelists for your timely updates on FDA's response to COVID and what may indeed be an inflection point at this point of the public health emergency. A lot of great information. Once again, I'm Elias Malice. Now we'll continue with the plenary session and our roundtable discussion. First, I'd like to welcome Dr. Doug Throckmorton, who joins the discussion panel. Dr. Throckmorton is a Deputy Center Director for Regulatory Programs at CEDAR. In this role, he partners with Dr. Cavazzoni, from whom we just heard, to oversee the regulation of research, development, manufacture, and marketing of prescription over-the-counter and generic drugs. Doug, thanks for joining our panel and for representing CEDAR for the plenary session. Let me now thanks set the lot. stage for pleasure. Let me now set the stage for this segment. The FDA's, the FDA's work involving COVID brought a lot of questions from the public. And over time, we've developed answers to many of these questions through policy decisions, outreach, and various town halls similar to this. Based on all of this, we've come up with a few questions that we'll discuss today. I'll read out the first question and each panelist will have a chance to share their thoughts about the topic. And then we'll continue with the next question. We'll do this in the order of our presentations. First to Dr. Jeff Sherwin of CDRH, second to Doug of CEDAR, and finally to Peter Marks of CBER. So let's get started with our very first question. Jeff, let's start with you. The volume of work involved with the COVID response, whether it be the number of regulatory submissions, data reviewed, and policies and procedures implemented has been substantial. Can you reflect on how all of this effort was managed in light of all of the non-COVID work to be completed? Well, thank you for that, uh, Elias. Well, the simple answer is we managed it as best we could. Um, as I mentioned in my presentation, you know, we dealt with a veritable tsunami of EUA requests and pre-EUA submissions as well as dozens of device shortages that put a tremendous strain on my center and contributed to delays in non-COVID work. And so, you know, we managed it by reallocating staff, issuing new flexible policies, and streamlining processes and approaches. Uh, Congress also helped out with additional funding that allowed us to hire uh, additional staff and obtain contractor support. All right, thank you, Jeff. And one of the first slides that you showed um, in your presentation showed a lot of impressive numbers and statistics, so thank you for that. Let's continue um, with this question to Cedar and welcome again, Doug Throckmorton. Thanks, Elias. I, I, I will echo what Jeff said. I, we responded because we had to. Uh, the people in Cedar, like the people in the other centers, understood the public health imperative and, and rose to the occasion. And, and they did that through the ways that people respond to crisis. People, process, knowledge management, and, and resources. And uh, as Jeff said, the resources are obviously came from Congress, and we greatly appreciated those. The people turned to the work that they were already doing in addition to the work that needed to be done. Uh, we put in place processes that addressed new needs, building on existing processes like uh, Dr. Marks mentioned. Um, and, and we worked very hard in areas like drug shortages to expand our acquisition of information wherever possible and integrate it into analytics systems that we could use to make the right decisions. One piece I'd add to the challenges that we faced in this last year had to do with 
with products that were not of high quality. So even as we worked to create products, you know, get products on the market that addressed public health needs, we also had to acknowledge that there were sometimes substandard products that were placed on the, on the market. Over 200 hand sanitizers, for instance, were placed into commerce that, that contained toxins, contained dangerous substances, and we needed to be able to move against those products. So enforcement was another important element of the work that we did. But addressing it required all of those pieces working together. Thanks very much. Thank you, Doug. Let's conclude this question and welcome back Peter Marks of Sieber. Yeah, so I, I will um, I completely echo uh, what uh, Jeff and Doug said. And just to amplify a little bit, um, there was a tremendous and there continues to be a tremendous workload coming into the center. And that's because um, we had the initial wave of vaccine development programs. But now we're seeing a wave of two different types of uh, applications coming in. First, we're starting to see the biologics license applications coming in uh, for the vaccines as they are maturing, uh, we're, and we're seeing additional emergency use authorization uh, requests coming in. So uh, essentially, applications continue uh, related to the first wave of vaccines. But we're also starting to see uh, investigational new drug applications uh, related to uh, newer generations of uh, COVID-19 vaccines. Plus, we're having to think about um, where the uh, variant strain selections will go uh, for future vaccines. So really, the volume of work, um, which was tremendous and required a triage of what we could get done and could not get done uh, exactly on time, uh, it continues. Um, and although we hope to be uh, compensated uh, by the end of this calendar year for the non-COVID related work, um, we're still uh, uh, very much uh, living with the weight of a tremendous number of COVID-19 vaccine submissions. Um, uh, in addition to uh, still uh, trying to uh, come out from under a quite a number of uh, submissions into our uh, cell and tissue uh, and gene therapy area. Thank you, Peter. And we're going to talk a little bit more about um, looking ahead in the future for all types of submissions um, later on in, in our discussion segment. All right, let's continue with our second question, question two. This will go back to Jeff Sharon of CDRH. We often say that people are their most important resource that we can have. Can you provide an update on how FDA staff are faring, such as morale, staffing levels, and attrition? I think overall morale is pretty good given what we've been through. And I, I really credit my colleagues in CDRH for their resilience. I'm very proud of what we together have accomplished. Uh, that said, it has taken a toll. Um, for example, our attrition rate has been creeping up from about 6% to now around 10%, although our ability to hire has remained pretty healthy. Now, one of the steps we've taken is to put a big focus on the wellness of our employees, uh, and that includes establishing a virtual wellness center and continue to invest in their professional development. We're going to be building on these investments as part of our 2022-2025 strategic priority to enhance organizational agility and resilience. And I think the funding we're going to get in Madufa 5 is also going to give us additional resources so we can hire more staff. Thank you, Jeff. Um, let's continue with this question to Doug of Cedar. Yeah, thanks, Elias. Uh, first, uh, like like uh, Jeff, and I'm sure Peter also, we're we're blessed with a workforce that is absolutely public health focused. I, I've I've worked in other agencies, and and it's it's amazing to me the real sense of purpose that that the staff in Cedar bring to their work every day. COVID was hard on everyone. It was hard on on regulators as well as regulated industry, and 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 the people 
took the brunt of a lot of that, I'm sure. Our people rose to that occasion. Um, we did see a fall in attrition, as uh, as Dr. Cavazzoni mentioned earlier. We, we um, you know, as people necessarily um, conserved changes as, as, as COVID raged. As it's, as it's improving, that situation's improving, we've seen a, a rise back to our usual rates of attrition. Um, and, and we're turning our focus, like, like Jeff, to building our workplace culture, um, encouraging diversity wherever possible, um, looking for expanded tools to enhance hiring, en enhance reimbursement and things wherever possible. Um, we're optimistic that the workforce that we were able to build during COVID is going to help us continue to succeed as, as COVID hopefully continues to uh, uh, stay quiet. Thanks. Thank you, Doug. Um, let's conclude this question, too, with re remarks from Peter Marks of Seaburn. So thanks. Um, I just I, I would echo that we have an amazing workforce that has really done uh, an incredible amount of work and has risen to the occasion during this pandemic. Um, people working uh, tremendous amounts uh, of time, extra hours, uh, time away from their families to uh, get work done uh, during holiday periods, nights, weekends, uh, you name it. Um, and they've done so while maintaining a relatively high level of morale uh, in, in, in support of public health. I, just, to, just to echo something that Doug just said, one of the things from the pandemic uh, that um, we have learned um, is that um, we can draw from a, a now a variety of both uh, workforce that will be present in our offices as well as those who will be virtual in the future going forward. Um, and that is important because it will allow us to have uh, a, a more diverse um, and uh, potentially uh, uh, savvier workforce that, uh, in, 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 in drawing from places that we could not draw before draw from before. Thank you, Peter. We are certainly adapting on so many um, ways um, as we navigate um, dealing with the pandemic. Um, let's continue with our next question, question three. Um, a recurring theme from this presentation, and frankly from all of the centers, featured agility, expedient decision-making, and really a high degree of communication between FDA and applicants. These efforts were done primarily to meet the timely needs of the public health emergency and likely involved substantial resources. Can you comment on the capacity to continue some of these efforts in the future? So Jeff, let's turn it back to you for your thoughts from CDRH. Oh, thank you. Well, for starters, um, adequate resources are essential if we're gonna you know, keep up a, a number of these activities. You know, for example, uh, during the pandemic, we've engaged, as I mentioned, in extensive engagement, um, lots of communication. You know, for example, the pre-EUA um, uh, process that we had where developers could work with our reviewers, get their questions answered and problems solved in real or near real time. And in fact, we engaged with over a thousand test developers alone, not to mention, the, you know, the scores of developers for other medical devices. It's just very resource intensive. Um, that said, um, you know, we push very hard for trying to get resources to continue this kind of activity uh, during peacetime, because we think this level of engagement is absolutely essential if we're going to sort of bridge that valley of death, if you will, from the time of you know, the concept for a medical device, bring it all the way to commercialization. Uh, and that's why in Medufa 5, we will have resources to at least pilot this approach uh, under TAP. So I'm very excited about that. You know, another key piece around agility was the ability to develop and issue guidances very quickly. And again, a lot of resources go into it. Um, you know, for our folks, it was all hands on deck get it done, move it forward, but it was truly a team effort across the administration, you know, where other, first of all, other parts of the agency engaging in doing that, and then up through uh, Department of Health and Human Services and the White House, just 
top priority and move it quickly. Uh, obviously, you know, uh, outside of that, things move at a different pace. Again, it's hard to put those level of resources, but I'd love to see something like that, you know, continue in the future if we're able to. And then finally was um, the importance of having regulatory flexibility. You know, as Peter mentioned, the EUA authorities really gave us the ability to tailor the regulatory pathway, you know, much better with the technology and then, you know, be agile to, you know, rapidly adapt as needed. Um, and we've been very big proponents of having those capabilities in peacetime, not to change the standard to market. And as Peter said, EUA standard is lower, not to change the standard to EUA, keep that reasonable assurance of safety and effectiveness you have for devices, but the ability to tailor the pathway to the technology, particular medical devices, that devices are so varied, you know, you can't use these cookie cutter pathways. And we're seeing those challenges arise with some of the more modern technologies, such as many of the digital health technologies that come our way. And so the only way to solve this is to change, you know, U.S. law to give us that flexibility. And again, that's something that I not only personally believe is important, something we've talked about for years as agile regulation or this idea of um, regulatory Legos that you can really build uh, pathways and tailor them. Uh, but if we don't do this, I do foresee challenges for many modern technologies in the U.S. marketplace moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. I love hearing about regulatory Legos. Sounds very interesting and innovative. Um, moving forward, let's continue this question three with Doug from C Cedar. Yeah, thanks, Elias. Look, look. The, the short answer is the things that have worked well as a part of our response for COVID should be looked at and extended into the non-COVID development regulation wherever possible. Um, and and I think Jeff's laid out really nicely several several things that his center's been doing. Let me talk about three different areas, areas that are important for us to think about in the Center for Drugs and that affect different parts of our mission. So I believe that the Remote Inspectional Evaluation Program, a program that we put in place to work to be more efficient, potentially reduce the need for on-site inspections during COVID when on-site on inspections were very challenging, um, was very valuable and, and proved successful, reduced the, 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 the numbers of needs for on-site inspections in some cases, helped us maintain our over 90% on-time rate and, and, and bring in 60 applications and 1,400 supplements to make decisions about them. That piece will affect manufacturing going forward. We look to to continue to work on REI because we think, RIE, sorry, because we think it's valuable and can affect and, and assist manufacturing going forward. We also worked very hard to expand our capacity as it relates to understanding the drug supply chain. We learned very early on that there were many facets of the supply chain that we needed to have greater understanding of. We've worked very hard to build a program to, to be able to respond to the, the, the challenges of drug availability. Um, through that response, we were able to prevent over 300 shortages during this last year. That kind of knowledge management system shouldn't be allowed to, to, to go fallow. And we expect to continue to work on that because we believe it's going to pay dividends for the American public. And the third thing I would mention is something that Dr. Cavazzoni mentioned in her remarks, the digital health technologies. Digital health is the future. It allows decentralized trials conduct. It, 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 it enhances the data collection, information acquisition, and, and analysis. It's critical, and it's something that we've just recently put guidance out on because we understand that it is something we, as a center, need to continue to foster, even as it was something that we worked very hard on to support during COVID. So... I'll just say again, if it worked during COVID, we need to look very carefully and expand its use in the non-COVID space wherever possible, Elias. Thanks very much. Thank you, Doug. Thank you for those remarks. Um, and then we'll conclude uh, with thoughts on this question from Sieber. And Peter, before sending it to you, I just wanted to say I really appreciated your reference to the work of the dry cleaner in by nine out by five. So 
love to hear your uh, thoughts on this question. Yeah, so we have uh, quite a number of innovative products in uh, in in CBER, uh particularly gene therapies uh, and uh, now genome editing products, and it's it's clear that they could benefit from uh, a similar approach that we applied to the COVID nineteen products, and in fact, um, there have been a number of patient advocacy groups that have come to us and said, look, we want our own operation warp speed for our uh, rare disease. Um, the challenge is that there's simply not enough bandwidth to do this right now on a broad scale. That said, we are considering pilot programs where uh, we take um, uh, promising uh, gene therapy products or other products um, and try to give them uh, the degree of uh, responsiveness that we gave to uh, the vaccines during Operation Warp Speed to see what difference does it make. And then we'll try to look at metrics there because I believe that, um, and I think we're, we all in the center uh, have the impression that um, if, uh, if we're able to show that um, this type of interaction makes a big difference uh, in terms of reducing the time for product development or uh, reducing the amount of product failures, um, hopefully uh, industry would support the staffing necessary uh, to uh, move this forward um, in the future. Thank you, Peter. Let's continue with our fourth question which uh, I know we've been talking about moving forward and planning ahead. Um, this question perhaps has us look up, look to the past and look at, and reflect on what occurred. So with question four, dealing with what we hope is a once a 100 year pandemic warranted reacting and adapting very quickly. Hindsight often brings lessons learned. Do you have any observations on what you would have done differently? So. Dr. Sharon um, of CDRH, let's send that one to you first. Well, I do hope this is a once in a hundred year uh, pandemic. I'm not as confident though that uh, it's gonna be another hundred years before we deal with something like this. So, you know, these questions are really um, critical. And I think as, you know, Doug and uh, Peter have noted, um, the, the lessons learned out of, uh, out of COVID really need to be applied, not just, first of all, preparing for, you know, the next big public health emergency, but also looking at what we can do in peacetime. You know, thinking about um, what we would have done differently, I think, you know, top of the list, uh, we would have engaged in more communication early on in the pandemic. And I think particularly with those test developers who are not used to working with the FDA. Um, and, and who really had, you know, some challenges moving forward. Um, I think um, doing more communication uh, would have been a, would have been very helpful. And and certainly um, there's been a lot of that through the pandemic. Uh, just highlight in particular, starting early in March, uh, we were, uh, began holding town halls and webinars. You know, for tests, we're holding a weekly town hall to provide updates and answer people's questions. And I think. This was very effective under the circumstances. And, you know, certainly if we had the bandwidth, I could foresee doing this uh, in the future in appropriate circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Um, let's continue this question four with Doug of Cedar. Yeah, thanks, Elias. And, and, and you're right. It's a critical question to ask that the senators are, are in the process, at least speaking for Cedar, we're, we're in the process of looking back at the work that we've done. And, and in some areas, it's, it's, a, it's a part of our standard process, standard operating procedure is to conduct you know, a look back um, like this. And in, in particular, around drug shortages and, and around other sort of emergency preparedness responses, we do this routinely. Um, it's not just COVID. We did this after the hurricanes in Puerto Rico, for instance, because... Um, as some of you may remember, you know, many hundreds of medical products manufacturers were on those islands. After that storm occurred, we needed to look back to see what changes needed to be made to improve our response to the next um, 
I'll hope for 100 years, Jeff. Let, let's go with 100 years um, uh, before we have to face something serious like this, because we have to prepare. We know emergencies are going to happen, and we need to, to be ready for it. Um, what, could, what could have been done differently? Um, as you look back, you can always look to see speed with which you were able to accomplish things and, 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 and wish that that speed had been a little bit faster, that you'd been able to communicate a little earlier. I think very early on, there was, there was a, a general, and I would say national potentially, um, underestimation of the impact and the duration that this might have. And, and um, I, I think we all learned very quickly and we responded very quickly. But going forward, I, I think we're going to have to work on our situational awareness to make sure we're ready to respond to anything that, that rises to this magnitude very, very quickly and appropriately. Uh, thanks very much. Thank you, Doug. Thank you for your comments on this question. Um, let's conclude this question and turn it over to Peter Marks of CBER. Yeah, thanks. So, you know, uh, this has been, we hope, a once in a hundred year pandemic. But we're used to, in CBER, seeing uh, epidemics um, every several years. Um, we dealt with Ebola. Um, we dealt with a near uh, miss in terms of Zika. Um, and uh, obviously, there have been influenza outbreaks. So this is something we're going to have to deal with. Um, you know, probably um, when we think about things we might have done differently, um, we clearly are, have not finished looking at everything uh, that might be done differently yet. But some of the things um, probably have to do with um, getting out guidance for manufacturers as quickly as possible. Um, we did it relatively rapidly, um, and I think we'd want to always uh, do that um, uh, as quickly as we uh, could uh, in the future. Um, uh, additionally, um, I think this is uh, something that we, uh, it, it's less of a direct thing at FDA and more of something that we will work with our partners on um, uh, as well as with industry on, uh, and that is uh, maintaining manufacturing readiness, um, not just for making the uh, products, but also for fill finishing them uh, because uh, it turned out that during this pandemic, we learned that um, the capacity along the manufacturing line from uh, the start of product production down to uh, the fill finish uh, and distribution all um, had to be uh, dealt with, and there were bottlenecks all along the way. So making sure we uh, have those addressed uh, for future um outbreaks, whether they be pandemics or epidemics, uh, is something we'll have to keep in mind. Peter, thank you for your thoughts for this question. Uh, a lot of great conversation, and we're going to continue with our next question, question five. Throughout FDA's response to the COVID-19 pandemic, we made substantial efforts toward expedient decision-making that increased the capacity for products to be available to the public in a timely manner. Now, how may these efforts be applied to other medical product areas that are not COVID related, and especially where a, sh a shortage in those areas presents a high degree of risk? So let's start with Jeff Shuren of CDRH for this question. All right, well, you know, I think as you've you heard from uh, me and Peter and Doug, uh, we're all saying, uh, we're all, I think, singing off the same song sheet about the things that the, that we did and the things that we would do and I I I, I and I'd say which it's, it's really more the same of what we talked about but specifically in the case of um, you know shortages as Doug talked about how important it is to have an established you know program and that you've got um, not only analytical but predictive capabilities you want to get out ahead of that shortage occurring in the first place and having you know excellent market intelligence is just so important and um, one way of feeding into it is not just access to data but there are authorities for reporting in when you've got a potential for shortage particularly with critical uh, medical products and certainly for us 
Uh, we did get funding from Congress uh, in COVID supplementals that have allowed us to build such a program, really first time to get funding to go do so. And already we've seen that with some limited authorities we have uh, enhancing our ability to expedite our prevention and response activities. I really do think that makes a difference. Um, and, you know, the other in terms of dealing with then with more product availability, like in the case of a shortage, as already mentioned, those two um, key ingredients in the secret sauce um, was once again, you know, that extensive engagement uh, as well as regulatory flexibility. And, you know, as discussed, uh, it would be great to have those capabilities uh, in the future for non-COVID products. Thank you, Jeff. Let's continue this question to Cedar and Doug for an answer. Yeah, thanks, Elias. First, let me just respond to, to one of the things that Jeff said, because one of the things that happened during COVID that I believe was a, a, a real positive was the continued growth of the work within the centers or between the centers. So CDRH and CBER and CDER have always shared our experiences around shortages, but I think especially around knowledge management, we've, we've made real strides in trying to knit together the data to understand better the work that the, the, the different centers are doing, both with regards to communications and, and data analytics and things. But I, 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 I agree with Jeff. Um, what we did in COVID, um, we've talked about already. We've, we've improved our IT systems, our data acquisition, our data analytics, as Jeff said. We've, we've improved our communications. Um, we've improved, in, in this, it, for, for CEDAR, we have worked with to improve our in, in, inspectional flexibility to make certain that we can respond quickly to a, a, a potential shortage to, uh, to, to alleviate or, or to mitigate it entirely. Um, we also need to take those learnings going forward. That is, they need to be applied going forward um, because other shortages are occurring. Even as COVID placed strains on the supply chain, for Cedar, we were, we were working on a background of ongoing drug shortages. And, and you could read in the news before COVID that we were being challenged to, to find essential medicines that were necessary for the American public. Uh, you can read in the press now that there's an ongoing IV contrast shortage um, unrelated directly to COVID. It's, it's, it's being driven by other forces. And so even as we respond to COVID, we have always understood that we needed to work on our management of the supply chain, our understanding of the supply chain, our, our, our tools to obviate or prevent a drug shortage. Um, as I said, we were very successful in this past year, preventing over 300 of them. Um, that required a substantial um, exercise in regulatory flexibility. Um, at the end of the day, we, we exercised regulatory flexibility over 100 times um, in the form of changes to submissions, um, expedited inspections, um, and, and the results were important, but we need to continue those efforts wherever it's appropriate uh, going forward because we, we understand that shortages will continue to occur. Um, Jeff is also right about the importance of the authorities. CDR and CDRH have some differences in terms of the authorities that we've been granted by Congress in terms of the information that the manufacturers are required to provide us. CDR received some information um, earlier. We are working very hard to maximize our use of that information, um, working with manufacturers one-on-one -on -one to understand the real reasons for a potential drug shortages, because we know that the more, way, the more we know about why a shortage is potentially going to occur, the more likely we are to be able to intervene. Intervene by finding another manufacturing site. Intervene by allowing the placement of a filter so that a product that has a particulate can, can, can continue to be marketed. Intervene in other ways to make sure that those essential medicines continue to be available. So I would add, in addition to all the things that Jeff has, has said, the critical need for the right kinds of information from manufacturers to us to really allow us to partner with them and, and, and prevent shortages from occurring. Thanks very much. 
Thank you, Doug. Thank you for your thoughts on this question. Let's conclude question five with Peter Marks of Seaburn. You know, just so that I don't, uh, so we save a little time, I'm just going to say that, that Doug really summarized this very nicely coming after uh, Jeff. And, and I really just would add that um, we've gotten a better sense um, to this of what, uh, what are our inviolate things that we must have and things that um, we can work around. Um, uh, and we also see this um, uh, as an area where we will work with uh, sponsors. Vaccines, very challenging area because people have very little tolerance for um, risk in prophylactic vaccines. So we have to balance this. Um, but um, we, we will, I think, um, keep in mind how to uh, mitigate shortages as best we can uh, using all of the tools that, that I think Doug and, and Jeff already described. Thank you, Peter, for your thoughts on this question. Um, I love this Q&A. Um, we have a few more questions to try to get through before we head to break. Um, so with that, let's continue with question six. Um, in the presentations, you touched upon future plans to transition products under EUA to the traditional marketing authorizations that we have. Um, and in some cases, we've actually started this process. Um, may you reflect on how you'll prioritize or balance these efforts with non-COVID-related submissions? So. Um, first, let's hear from Jeff Sherman, CDRH. Uh, the short answer is in our draft guidance on transitioning, you know, from EUA to full marketing authorization, we had proposed, so if this were in the final guidance, that um, if you're coming to us with a pre-market submission, if you get it in in time, you stay on the market while the submission is under review. Um, and with that in mind, if that's the policy, our bigger focus will be on the non-COVID uh, devices because the ones under EUA are already on the marketplace. They won't come off the market while it's under review. So should it take a little bit more time? I'm not saying it will, but should it, that won't disenfranchise the availability of the product. Because on the flip side, we do want to make sure that uh, for new product, not on the marketplace for non-COVID, uh, that we are, you know, expeditious around that. And certainly uh, our big goal here is meeting our Mendufa uh, commitments for our performance goals. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Let's continue this question with Cedar and Doug. Yeah, I'll, and I'll, I'll try to, to keep it brief, Elias. First, uh, as Jeff mentioned, you know, we issued um, guidances during covid that you know, we now need to look again to decide if, if those flexibilities can continue to be extended. Uh, absolutely would do that to the extent we could. We believe those flexibilities would be useful for development of products um, that are uh, under, under the traditional pathways. Second, we have consciously worked with sponsors of EUAs to make certain that the data they submitted to us was in a form that was efficiently transferred to our traditional drug development pathways. Um, it's been something our Office of Infectious Diseases has spearheaded, but the other offices that have been developing EUAs have also done it. We think that's essential so that we're not starting over. So products that move into the traditional sphere, traditional pathways, um, don't start over. They, they start on a baseline of the information that's been collected during the EUA period. Um, and then the third thing is we're watching very carefully. Um, we don't believe... Um, for instance, in the Office of Infectious Diseases, we've looked very carefully at the existing EUAs. We don't believe that the work that's necessary to transition them to, to investigation under traditional drug development is going to affect our, 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 the, the time of our, our product development. It's something that our Office of New Drugs is watching carefully, though, to make sure we have resources in the right areas. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you, Doug. Let's conclude this question and turn it over to Peter Marks of C. Yeah, no, thanks. I, I think much like Jeff, we're going to try to make sure we maintain our uh, our user fee goals for our uh, products that are non-COVID related. And then we will prioritize the COVID related products as they transition over from uh, EUA to, uh, uh, to traditional marketing authorization, um, uh, because we recognize that particularly for the vaccines, uh, many people feel more comfortable with 
licensed vaccines and emergency use authorized vaccines, or at least some people do. And so uh, as we can bring, we've already taken two of the vaccines, uh, which are now uh, moved from emergency use authorization uh, for adults to licensed for adults. And as more uh, aspects of them, uh, the, the pediatric portions and the booster portions uh, uh, come in as supplements, we'll try to move those over to the license as well. So we will continue to uh, prioritize as we can uh, within our resources uh, for the COVID-related products while maintaining our other uh, goals um, uh, to the best of our ability for the non-COVID-19 uh, uh, related products. All right, Peter, thank you. I know we are just at time. We're going to skip a couple of questions and go to our very last question of the session um, with a very short uh, um, question and answer. So question nine, our last question of today, um, looking ahead, will we, will we be talking about COVID-19 at Ready 2023 next year? And if so, uh, will each of our esteemed panelists accept our invitation to return to the program? So, Jeff Sherman of CDRH, let's uh, wrap up with your thoughts. Uh, well, we'll be talking about COVID uh, next year. Well, I sure as heck hope not. Uh, that said, um, be happy to come back. All right, thank you. Um, Doug, the same question to you uh, on behalf of yourself and Patrizia. Yeah, I think I hope that to the extent we're talking about COVID, it is in a look back frame. Um, and since I'm a pinch hitter, esteemed speaker or whatever, uh, I'm, I'm sure that Dr. Cavazzoni would be delighted to return, as, as, as would I. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and we'll conclude this um, session with Peter Marks um, and your thoughts. So thanks. Uh, you know, whether or not uh, we're looking at it in the rear view mirror or through the windshield, I'll be back next year. Thanks a lot. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much. And with that, Peter, you get the last word of our session for the Ready 2022 plenary session, COVID-19, what's next for FDA? To our esteemed panel, Dr. Jeff Shuren of CDRH, Drs. Cavazzoni and Throckmorton of CEDAR, and Dr. Marks of CBRR. Thank you all so much for taking your time out of your busy schedules to spend this time to have a conversation with us about the important work of the FDA in the fight against covid I'd like to share my personal appreciation for your tireless leadership and really your accessibility in speaking so openly about the public health response from the FDA. I think it's quite a treat to have all of you all here today in the same forum um, for our public. Um, it's really special. My thanks to our global audience for joining us for this very special session. I truly hope you enjoyed learning from our FDA leadership on this important topic. This now concludes the plenary session. We'll now take a break and when we come back at 11 a.m. Eastern Time, 